Mr. President, Mr. President, a second One Piece video has hit the Datachi. <laughs> hi, hi, it's Datachi. And uh, I swear this isn't a One Piece channel now, please don't go. Recently, I released a video with my thoughts on One Piece and why you should watch it, and I'll link it below. Well, something I never mentioned in the video is the art of One Piece, and more specifically, the character designs. That's what we're here to talk about today. Character design is a very unique form of problem solving, and if you aren't super into it, you may not be aware how much work can go into a single character's appearance. A character design is a form of narrative language, which means it should ideally communicate something to the audience about the character. For example, a design like, let's say, Mickey Mouse has an overpoweringly iconic silhouette, is mostly composed of these circular round shapes that make him appear welcoming and friendly and squishy, <laughs> and the colours they wear are warm and brighten up as dark and natural colours. With that in mind, I want to apply that same level of scrutiny to the character of Ichiro Oda's One Piece, since I feel like there's a lot we can learn from over 25 years of wacky characters, and I want to experience it all. But before we begin, this video contains SPOILERS, and that includes some details of the current arc. I'm going to be talking as if you've watched or read a decent amount of One Piece, so if you don't want to risk any spoilers, come back in approximately 1,122 chapters, alright? Let's talk about Luffy right off the bat. Luffy is a deceptively simple design that I feel gets a lot of information across very efficiently. He's basically the base model for boys in One Piece, which makes sense as he was probably one of the first characters designed for the manga. He's dressed as a vacationer, that look being sold by those shorts, sandals, and that iconic hat. That hat serves as a reminder of the relationship between Luffy and his father figure Shanks, while also being reminiscent of the sun, which if you're far enough into One Piece you know is important. Last of all is his scar, or in recent time, scars. There's one on his face right beneath his left eye. He got that one from stabbing himself trying to prove to Shanks he was a real man and could be taken out to sea, and it's basically a permanent reminder of the danger he's willing to put himself to prove himself. It is a reminder of Luffy's recklessness. Now, while not in the original source material, there is a line by Shanks in live action in response to Luffy's facial scar that I really like. Don't think too good. I want everyone to see my scar. Scars don't make them out of Luffy. Lesson behind the scar. It also adds to Luffy's other and more recent scar, the giant cross across his chest. This is from arguably the most traumatic period of his life, when he lost his crew, fought some genuinely unwinnable battles, and watched as his brother was turned into a donut. Regardless, it shows he survived, and most importantly, acts as a permanent mark of the incident. It's something he can't forget, and forever shape him as a person. All of that is what we can get from the good character design, and that isn't even including stuff like colour, like the red of his vest easily being seen as a sign of passion and determination, or stuff like shape language, or Luffy's distinctive silhouette. This comes together to not only produce a recognisable and distinct character design, but also one that helps us shape our understanding of the character. And that's awesome! That is the artistry of character design and that work is split amongst hundreds of characters in the manga. There are a lot of good character designs in One Piece, but we don't really have time to go through all of them, maybe a later video. What I do think we can do is look at trends in Oda's character design. Let's start with a simple idea, that being how you show the development of a character through changing their design. And I think the best example in the main cast for this is Brook. Brook is a skeleton, in more ways than one. Yes, he is literally a walking corpse, but he's also a man who's figuratively and literally stuck in the past. After the tragic death of his crew and being isolated for 50 years in this form, how do you present that information? Well, he's literally stuck in the outfit he died in, with it falling apart on his body. Under his blazer, where on a human you would expect to see a dress shirt, the similarly coloured ribcage is instead on full display, and is a constant reminder that he's dead. And then, the time skip happens. 
When we see his character again after two years, he's become a rock star and completely glowed up. He has a giant feather boa, this colourful floral outfit and an electric guitar, which is quite the step up from his violin. This design informs us of his character growth really well. Not only do we get the impression that he is popular, but we also get the impression that he's moved on from his period of isolation and is embracing his new fame, his family. No longer in that rotting tux and bearing a new modern instrument, it reflects his growth perfectly. Character designs like these are pretty common, although they can be more subtle and connect characters in different ways. Zoro and Sanji are the two wings of the Pirate King, which is to say both of these two, combined, working together, work to help their captain Luffy achieve all their dreams. They also make out while oiled up. Their designs prior to the time skip are already pretty solid. Zoro's earthy tones and green hair makes him a clear opposing force to Luffy through their complementary colour schemes, which fits with him usually being seen as a second-in-command or as a foil that keeps him in check, at least early on. Sanji's design focuses more on portraying him as slick and refined, with a suit shaded in an all-black, which not only helps bring attention to him, but also accentuates his silhouette, especially his legs, making them look longer than they are which works really well considering his fighting style. This is somewhat contrasted with his goofy eyebrow, which lets you know that he's not exactly the suave mofo he wants you to believe he is. Already on their own, both designs are pretty distinct and memorable, but with the post-time skip designs, not only are these features expanded upon, but they're also recontextualized in relation to each other. Zoro's mostly the same, with the most obvious new detail being that missing eye. Now. I mentioned before how scars in a character design can portray information. Well, when Zoro was introduced in 1999, he was shown as the fierce pirate hunter of the East Blue, and one of the most feared bounty hunters in that sea. The very act of Luffy recruiting him was supposed to be a reckless one, teaming up with a cold-hearted pirate killer. While we travel with him in the first half of the story, we learn that Zoro is a goofy, dense meathead of a man with a good heart, and while he certainly is a stoic, he is not immune to the inherent slapstick of One Piece's universe. So, when the Straw Hats reunite after two years and suddenly is missing an eye, there's a layer of separation again. What caused him to lose it? What the fuck did he do? Did he lose it? Did he literally get lost? There's intrigue here, it's cool. Similarly, Sanji's design is mostly the same. The same matte-coloured suit to distinguish his silhouette, and the notable feature here is his eye. Before, he always had bangs covering his left eye, but after the time skip, it swapped to cover his right. This is in part related to his backstory revealed in Whole Cake Island. It could be interpreted that he covers his eyes to hide his eyebrows that tie him to his biological family. You could also see the bangs moving to this position as to draw parallels between Sanji and his mother, someone who was representative of the kindness that is called to Sanji's character. Uh, a, a, another detail I forgot to mention is that Sanji's eyebrows, they, they curl the opposite direction of his siblings. It, it, except when he unlocks his full German powers, I just, I, I just think that's cool. But also, this draws a direct parallel towards Zoro, whose left eye now remains permanently shut, and Sanji, whose right eye is now covered by his bangs. It makes their two character designs fit together like pieces of a puzzle, like a dick in the ass, and they together are the wings of the Pirate King. And despite their disagreements, these two are both deeply loyal to Luffy and each other, and it's reflected in their designs. I want to talk about the art style Oda uses for One Piece, because some of the mofos in One Piece look goddamn weird. Like really, really weird. In the current arc, Egghead, we got to meet the alleged smartest man in the world of One Piece, Dr. Vegapunk. He's been teased for literal decades for the world-changing experiments he's worked on and crazy technology he's developed. So imagine everyone's surprise when he looked like this. So first off, just to address the obvious, Dr. Vegapunk is very clearly riffing off of the real-world scientist Albert Einstein, who I probably don't need to explain much to you about. Hell, Vegapunk's massive lolling tongue is based off this specific image of Einstein. There's also the topic of Vegapunk's giant ass noggin. Dr. Vegapunk ate the brain brain fruit, or the no me, no me, no me, in Japanese. 
I, I just I just think it's funny it happened like that. Which gave him the ability to have his brain grow rapidly without limit, giving him his giant egghead filled with knowledge. He later cuts this out to put in a supercomputer with thousands of memories in it, t t t don't ask, and covers the top of his head with an apple cap, very clearly based on the story of the apple landing on Isaac Newton's head and leading to his ideas about gravity. <laughs> Yet another widely influential physicist. I love this character design, but my favourite detail is one that a lot of people seem to overlook. That being how his head is literally shaped like a giant light bulb. Like he's always got a new idea to share, it's brilliant. So many characters in One Piece look entirely distinct from each other. Even if you don't remember their names, there's a cue in their design that at least helps you recognise them. Like Doflamingo's choice of wardrobe. See, when I think of Don Quixote Doflamingo, I think of fucking poison. A bit of a strange statement, but, but hear me out. Despite every crime, every new victim drawn into his thrall, and every person who lost everything to a man who believes himself above everyone else, he presents as a generous leader. His charisma is overflowing. I think the bright colours he wears almost acts like an overcorrection on his part. Him trying to make himself look more appealing, the bright pink boa especially being really eye-catching. The same way a brightly coloured toad in the jungle may draw you in with its bright appearance, its nonchalance and attention-drawing colours only exist to imply critical danger. To me, in the same way, Doflamingo, who I'd say is presented as being conventionally attractive, you know, tall, well-built, tan, presents a sadist wrapped in a lie of caring for the people. Despite being a beloved king, the head of his family, and definitely not cult, the Doflamingo pirates, he harbours this inherent insincerity, this sadistic behaviour wherever he goes, all wrapped up in this brightly coloured package. And those sunglasses that mark a permanently devilish scowl across his face, leaving no room to read his eyes or to form any farce of sympathy. I think it all coalesces to form the bizarre image of this fucking flamboyant, unreadable psychopath. One Piece's aesthetic is very recognisably anime, but it's also a lot more exaggerated. In the early days of the manga, I could honestly look at any of these characters and think they're made of rubber. It's goofy, and works well with the slapsticky and over-the-top adventure that defines the series. And while it's not like I have an actual number or anything, I do know there's quite a few people who don't gel with One Piece's presentation, since it comes off as childish or kinda ugly. And I don't know if I fully understand that. I think there's a genuine aversion, at least in the West, to stuff that isn't ultra-realism or hugely conventionally appealing. I do get why some of these character designs may be a bit much, but I also think that the way that we pigeonhole art is only ever going to backfire. We're going to keep getting given the same aesthetics in every project forever unless we show interest in variety, you know? But I also understand it's down to personal taste, and I can't really say that someone is wrong for not engaging with it. Although, on the topic of personal taste, this is a video about Ichiro Oda's art style, so <sighs> it's time for that part of the video. That's right, guys. It's a One Piece video on the internet. Do you know what we've got to talk about now? Do you know what? <sighs> This topic can be a bit of a sensitive area for some people, so I do want to make some things clear. There is nothing wrong with drawing conventionally attractive women. There is nothing wrong with liking to draw hourglass body types. Nor is there anything wrong with exaggerating the female form. I like female character designs in One Piece. I really like Perona's design, Big Mom, the Vegapunks. There's a lot of ones with love out there in this series. I think both of Nami's designs are really good, and while her modern incarnation falls victim to the more male gazy side of things, it still reflects her character rather well. Like, it's a pretty reasonable thing to see a seafaring woman wear, at least I think so. The consequences of said art is its own problem, but that's not what this video is about. What this is about, however, is that every girl 16 and up in One Piece has this exact same body type. Remember looking at all the weirdness and variety in Oda's characters and how they could inform us about the characters Oda made? That entire dimension of character design is tossed away. Look at this character design. Re 
Rebecca is a 16-year-old gladiator who's been battling away in a coliseum against her will after being kidnapped by the Don Quixote pirates. She was taught to fight by her guardian at a young age, due to fears of people being after her life. We can determine some of this from a straight-up bikini armor and a 16-year-old really man and her gladiator helmet. How much more would we be able to learn about her if her body was more built? Maybe if she had stronger arms or body scars? What if her eyes were differently shaped, maybe more determined, more tragic? We lose out on information because women can apparently only look like this. Because women are just a triangle with two cantaloupes strapped on. Also, before anyone mentions the rules of Dressrosa's Torment, like, I, look, I know it meant people had to be light on armor. I am sure there was an outfit that could have wormed its way out of Oda's head that could convey this information better than this does. And look, once again, I'm not saying it's bad for a character to be conventionally attractive or exaggerated. A character like Boa benefits greatly from this exaggerated, unrealistic beauty standard. Her character hinges on both the concepts of objectification of women and how she's viewed by people who are attracted to her. But we do lose something with this. I'd say it's bad character design, but when I think about it as a whole, I think it's just... lazy. Now, I do want to say that a lot of the female character designs are just totally neutered by the way Toei has rendered them all, and the manga tends to give them a few more distinct features, but I'd argue the state of things is still pretty bad. There are exceptions. Really stellar ones, even, but even they aren't immune to the Triangle Syndrome. Like, how, how do you draw Big Mom as this big blob of a child, and the modern incarnation is a much older and stronger version of that design, and then have the midpoint be this monstrosity? It's lame. Also, because I, I, I know people are gonna ask what my opinion of how black people are drawn in One Piece is, and like... I'll be real. I think there was some not so great stuff early on, but I don't think there's been a like, particularly offensive looking design in years. I know some people are mixed on Usopp's lips, but I like them. It's clearly not offensive imagery like early Dragon Ball or anything. Bro just has thick lips. A lot of black people have thick lips. I have them. That's not to say Oda's totally innocent on that front, nor do I think every anime should use the donut lips. I just like how they look here in this specific instance. Toei's whitewashing and very flagrant colorism sucks though, like sucks total balls. Anyway, let's wrap this mess up. So we got a little bit negative near the end there, huh? That aside, One Piece's artwork and character design continues to be one of those elements that gives the world so much personal charm. It's still something I haven't seen replicated in any other long-running manga or even other pieces of media, and that Unique, goofy charm, even in a story that goes to some fucked up places, is something I can really appreciate. Oda was showing his damn vision whether people like it or not, and I can only really respect the magnum dong at play here. And maybe that's something we can take from all of this. I feel like it's easy to dismiss our own ideas for lacking a conventional appeal or being experimental, but we can't ever know until we try. So let's try to put some unique art out into the world. Let's try to make some absolutely banging character designs while we're at it too. The day we pick up the pen and make something we can all truly be proud of, let's all greet each other with a smile. But until then, I'll see you guys in the next one.